Hello everybody, Simon Dixon here, CEO and co-founder of banktothefuture.com and welcome to episode 38 of Bank to the Future Live, BF Live. Uh, we've got lots of good news to cover today, lots of announcements, lots of deals we've been working on for a long time um, and uh, we're going to go straight in and dive right in. So the first thing that we're going to be covering today is updates on our status with US investors. Um, there's not very much good news for US investors nowadays in crypto. In fact, every day there seems to be another bit of bad news for US investors in participating in the cryptocurrency markets and the growth of financial technology. But today at Bank to the Future, we have been working uh, very hard in order to bring more opportunities to US investors in compliance with um, Securities and Exchange Commission rules and laws. Uh, we've been working, we've got a bit of a, a, a history we'll go through today in making that happen. Um, but today we're very happy to announce that we have made a strategic investment in our good friends at BMI Capital over there in the US, uh, which is an SEC and FINRA registered US broker dealer, um, so that we can expand the amount of opportunities available to uh, US investors through the banktothefuture.com platform, but also security token offerings to institutional investors in the US. We think we cracked the process um, and uh, we're very uh, happy to announce that. Um, and some other things around card payments, uh, lots of portfolio news today, um, and uh, many other things that we'd like to announce. Many companies reached their funding goal, um, every company in the last few weeks, and also some uh, pitches cancelled. So we'll go through uh, the latest updates. Also some news on new deals going live on the secondary market and the process for listing new deals. We'd like your input. We'd like you to vote on what you'd like to see next so that we can um, get engaged what our um, investor community is looking for. Um, I'm happy to say that I'm back grounded after the China, Korea, Switzerland, uh, Italy roadshow. Um, and uh, if I've got some time when we do the Q&A and AMA at the end of this video, uh, we'll try and cover some of my insights that I got from China because it was a very interesting week in China and in Korea. Um, lots of exciting stuff happening there that I'll update you on if we have time. But remember, Bank to the Future Live, BF Live is all about, um, I give lots of updates on, on my personal Twitter, on my personal YouTube around the growth of the cryptocurrency markets and what's happening there. But this is our, our weekly episode just for our Bank to the Future investor community, um, companies seeking funding on Bank to the Future, or those engaging in the security token ecosystem either through our Bank to the Future wallet, um, our Bank to the Future token, um, and various other parts of our ecosystem. Uh, this is where we get to cover just the things that you want us to cover um, and uh, you get to ask your questions. So there's a number of ways of doing that. Um, if you are on Twitter, then use the hashtag, hashtag BFLive, and uh, one of our team members will try and find your question and pick that up. And we have Famida on the line, as we do every week, um, and she'll be actually moderating, picking out questions and letting me know if there's any technical issues. So. Uh, please do use the live chat. If you've got questions on, if you're watching this on YouTube, use the live chat. If you're watching the recording, use the comment section and we'll return back to it and see if we can answer those questions in future episodes of Bank to the Future Live. If you're on Telegram, we created a group when we launched our token, the Bank to the Future token, and that was at BF underscore token. Um, and uh, you can go over, head over there and you can ask any questions in Telegram. Uh, with our administrators who will pick them out and try and get them uh, to Fumida so that we can ask those. Uh, we've already got a number of questions, so we'll be covering those. So without further ado, I'm just going to jump straight in to the latest news and updates, just pulling up my show notes um, to remind me what we got going on. So the big news today for us is that uh, Bank to the Future, Coin Street, and BMI Capital have all put together a partnership um, and both Coin Street and Bank to the Future have made a strategic investment in BMI Capital, um, which is a SEC FINRA registered US uh, broker dealer. 
Um, and we will be using that in order to bring more deals and more opportunities to US investors. To give you the backstory, um, uh, for years we've been working on um, you know, Reg D compliant offerings um, and uh, we've always wanted to do it via a, a broker dealer. So a long time ago, several years back, we made an investment in a broker dealer called Keystone Capital Corporation. Um, that uh, that uh, company later went on to be acquired by Coinbase um, so that they can start one of our portfolio companies, Coinbase, so that they can start expanding into the security token market. Um, we then did a partnership with uh, GB Capital Markets and we'll still continue um, to see how we can work together. Um, but we are now working with an acquisition, um, a strategic investment we've made in BMI Capital. And so we'll be uh, sharing further details on that. But what it does is um, they have a very strong foothold in the institutional investor market, both in the US and Asia. Um, and CoinStreets uh, have also been doing lots of great work with uh, doing investor roadshows across Asia so that when our portfolio companies come to us, one of our requirements when listing on Bank to the Future is that they have secured a lead institutional investor and been through the due diligence process of a lead institutional investor. And through our partnership with CoinStreet, we can facilitate those that haven't quite secured the lead investor, get them to go on a roadshow, see if they can pass the due diligence of the professional uh, full-time investors. Um, and then we can co-list and syndicate through banktothefuture.com and you can co-invest, our, our qualifying investor community can co-invest. Um, if that deal wants to take on US investors, they can do that via our broker-dealer partnership, which will be deeply integrated into the Bank to the Future platform um, and make a real seamless, easy user experience. And of course, our Bank to the Future identity solution, BFID, um, that we'll be rolling out. We have started to roll out on the platform, um, but we will be using um, in order for you and our qualifying investors to be able to use uh, the certification, the qualification, and the verification status that you've done on Bank to the Future uh, for other platforms and engage in the security token market as it grows. Um, we spent some time uh, in China meeting uh, with the BMI Capital team as they happen to be there as well when we were on Roadshow and also with uh, Adam Vaziri, our EU uh, broker dealer and corporate finance partner that we also made a strategic investment in. Uh, we've made three uh, such deals this year. The technology of Allcoin.io, which we're looking to build into a security token exchange um, powered by the Bank to the Future token, of course and also our EU broker dealer and our US broker dealer, which will all be deeply integrated into our Bank to the Future identity solution, which brings more liquidity and more opportunities for those looking to engage in our ecosystem. Um, most of our primary market offerings have all been selling out um, without US investors. And we've been having lots of complaints, lots of people that want from the US that want to engage in these deals, but we're happy to say that we've been working on that um, and one of the other things is ensuring that we're compliant with US escrow um, account uh, requirements. So we have now completed our integration so that we can now do card payments and bank transfers um, for our US investors that will be signed off by our broker dealer um, so that they can actually um, engage in uh, via a compliant way uh, compliant with uh, US securities and uh, securities laws. Um, so we look forward to bringing back card payments, bank transfers, US investors. It was a huge distraction from our roadmap because we had to make uh, a lot of changes in light of regulatory changes um, in, the, in the environment in the US. But we're very happy to say that those, uh, those deals and those integrations are ready for completion. Um, it's an interesting time now because things are always quiet over Christmas. So we have about four or five deals lined up and we'll just be deciding whether to launch shows before Christmas or do an extended time frame after Christmas because everything goes very quiet during that Christmas phase. 
Um, so that's the latest there. So look forward to bringing back car payments, uh, more compliant escrow, more opportunities uh, for US investors. Um, and uh, we're very happy to bring that some good news for uh, the US investor community, which seem to be locked out of everything right now in light of regulatory crackdowns from those that haven't been complying with those uh, their processes. So in terms of pitches live, um, at the moment, the main deal we have on the platform is Voltoro. They had a funding goal of $900,000. They are uh, they're, they're through to approximately nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars in overfunding, um, and they're still open uh, for qualifying non-U.S. investors. Um, these deals have not been signed off by uh, our U.S. investors. I'm um, sorry, our U.S. broker dealer. But as we um, start to do our uh, roll out our partnership and integrations over the coming weeks. Um, please let us know and support whether you were interested in these deals, but because you're US, you were locked out, so that we can then return to them and ask them if they're willing to uh, relaunch a US campaign for you, for our US investors as well. Um, at the moment, there's Voltoro Live. It's completely in overfunding. Remember, the rules of overfunding are that it doesn't dilute people investing in this round. It means that the company is willing to sell more equity um, and uh, open it up to a wider pool, uh, more investors that may not have made it in time. But the rules are if they decide that they want to close at any time, they can close early because they've already meet, met their goal um, and they're in overfunding. So Voltoro is live right now, but all of the other pitches um, are sold out and closed. So we closed Edge today, um, which again wasn't open to US. We'll be speaking with the Edge team about whether they want to launch a US compliant pitch. Uh, for, for those that might have missed out, just let us know if you'd like to see that. Also, Loyal, after announcing their deals with their deal with Emirates Airlines to, to, to do their blockchain loyalty scheme, uh, they went into overfunding and sold out as well. Um, we had one pitch that we are issuing refunds for because uh, DX Exchange announced that they will be closing their platform. Uh, due to a merger and acquisition deal that they're negotiating at the moment. So um, because that went, that happened, uh, we, uh, the, in light of the recent update, we closed the pitch and uh, we will be issuing refunds to anybody that um, made a, a pledge to that pitch. Um, if any issues there, then please do reach out to our support and we'll make sure that we get those funds back to you, uh, which you can use for future pitches um, or you can withdraw them um, at any time. We also released today a much faster withdrawal process. We've been listening to your feedback um, and uh, you know, we still have to make sure that we do all of the um, AML anti-money laundering compliance processes. So we can't operate as fast as a cryptocurrency exchange where we just allow those to happen without additional checks but we've now released some additional technology that is gonna significantly um, improve the speed at which we can process withdrawals for those of you that are withdrawing either Ether, Bitcoin, Bank to the Future tokens, or Tether based upon uh, either Omni or Ethereum. Um, we don't have that process yet for some of the more, some of the obscure tokens that you might be holding, um, but for those, uh, we've got a much more streamlined process and hopefully you enjoy uh, the faster results. We've also released the automated process for depositing both US dollars um, and um, bank to the future tokens and Tether, of course. Um, those automated process, we're already seeing a much greater increase in efficiency, which was one of the main things that we were waiting for in order to take our secondary market out of beta. Um, we've got some announcements around our secondary market, so uh, we'll also be making some uh, additional announcements there. Um, but to give you the heads up, uh, we would like to engage you, our investor community, in order to help us um, vote on what the secondary markets you would like to see next. Um, heading up, to, we've been receiving lots of feedback and heading up to us coming out of beta, um, and engaging in a much more aggressive marketing scheme in the new year, um, we want to add two, uh, one secondary market to our platform every two weeks. Um, and so we'll be doing some polls. Head over to our Telegram group if you'd like your input 
on what you would like to see on the secondary market. And also we'll try and do some Twitter polls, um, but do reach out to us, let us know what you'd like to see. And uh, we'll be uh, prioritizing those based upon um, the success of the company and also what our investor community feedback that they would like to see. As I said, we've, I'm not going to say them right now because um, there's a bit of uncertainty around timing, but we're currently working on four new deals that have all contracted to list their deals on Bank to the Future. And I think that we should be launching one more major deal. Um, you know, the, we, we have approximately, you know, lots of earlier stage companies and then, you know, approximately four deals a year that we consider major deals. Uh, that, come, that our investors would love to see. We've got one of those, we're just trying to work on the timing. In terms of our secondary market, um, in beta, we're seeing lots of undervalued opportunities while liquidity is very low. Um, lots of um, discounts uh, for people that want to acquire shares in our SPV significantly below uh, the current valuations due to the liquidity discounts we're seeing in the current market uh, as a result of liquidity being low, still being in beta, and us not starting our um, marketing campaigns that were due to start next year because we were waiting uh, for us to uh, secure our EU uh, broker-dealer partnership and uh, investment, our US broker-dealer partnership and investment, um, and some of the other things that we've got planned and installed for you um, throughout 2020. We're really excited about 2020. Um, lots of things are coming together at the same time as Bitcoin halving, which is always a great roller coaster year. The two times we've experienced Bitcoin halving as we move into the third one. So, live on our secondary market right now, we have the blockchain.com SPV, the BitPay SPV, the Kraken SPV, um, and we're starting to reach the phase. Uh, where um, we'll be able to um, enable those that invested in the Series B that are not from the US. Um, we're, starting, we're starting to reach a phase in the coming weeks where we'll be able to allow people to place uh, our OTC orders on the market um, in order to buy and sell uh, the Kraken SPV. At the moment, it's only open to those that invested in the Series A um, about five years ago. So we're getting lots of questions from people saying, how come I can't sell my shares? It's because the lock-in period is not through. Um, and for US investors, uh, the lock-in period um, as per SEC requirements is uh, that mandatory one-year lock-in. Um, we do not have a process for US investors being able to purchase on our secondary market. Uh, that will require a lot more work. So unfortunately, even though we are progressing in the right direction, uh, buying on the secondary market is not available to US investors in the current um, environment. Uh, we've also got the Circle SPV, the Bitfinex SPV, which is our most liquid secondary market, and the Ripple Labs SPV. Uh, the interesting thing about Ripple Labs is the current valuations on our secondary market values Ripple Labs at about $4 billion. And last time I looked, they own about uh, $14, $15 billion worth of XRP tokens on top of all the technology that they built. So we're seeing some really interesting arbitrage valuation plays uh, for those that want to build a portfolio in the largest companies in crypto uh, before we move our secondary market out of beta. As I said, we're going to be adding one new secondary market every two weeks uh, from now on um, until we have uh, a lot more um, uh, opportunities uh, for, for that later. <clears throat> Also um, to celebrate, and we're going to be making some really big announcements. Um, and the next conference I will be speaking at is in January, mid-January at the North America Bitcoin Conference in Miami. Um, and uh, I'll, we just got back from the China and Korea Roadshow and we'll be kicking off another roadshow um, for that. So uh, we look forward to seeing you there. I don't often get to the US, but now uh, we have our uh, partnership secured. Uh, we'll be going on a bit of a roadshow with our US broker dealer to make sure that they're um, uh, in all the right circles in the crypto markets, both from the company perspective and also the institutional investors so that we can bring that forward. So there's lots of uh, great news and announcements. Uh, maybe I'll take a quick pause before I go through portfolio news because maybe uh, Fami has got some questions that I can take. 
Um, and we've got really, some really great updates from our portfolio companies that I'm really excited about sharing with you. And also, obviously, some updates on uh, the announcement with Bitfinex and uh, the, Kim, the K.IM platform. Uh, I'll be covering my perspective on that as well uh, later in the show. But let's see if we've got any questions at this stage and we can jump right into them before we cover portfolio news. So, Fumido, have you got anything for us at this stage? Yes, we do. Actually, we have quite a few questions that have come through. Uh, whilst I gather them, do you want to tell people about the weather behind you there? <laughs> yes, yeah, a little bit grim. <laughs> so it's not as uh, sunny as usual. Um, but uh, yeah, this is uh, the rainy season. So. All right. So uh, first question I've got here is uh do you would you consider increasing the premium membership from 10k to 100k bft at least um i guess they're just hoping that you would consider it um just to be fair to early investors um well it's a very easy thing to say that we could do but there'll be lots of unintended consequences um so for example we then have to figure out a two-tiered system whereby those that have already um, staked the 10,000 don't get locked out of their premium membership because we've increased it to 100,000. Uh, then we need to consider um, the, you know, uh, how, we have, how we implement that two-tiered system, get the communications right. Um, and so overall, I think it could get pretty messy um, doing that. What we, uh, what we think is more interesting is Look, the, 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 the token market is in a very strange place. Um, we obviously had the 2017 boom and bust cycle for all tokens. Um, and uh, that's had a correction. And I think it's going to filter down to a few tokens that are actually doing stuff. Um, at Bank to the Future, we've been around since 2010. We are doing stuff. We've got lots of interesting plans. At the same time, the market needs to adjust to what is going to happen to utility tokens and security tokens. What people do with their utility tokens will determine whether it's a security token or not in the future. Um, the problem and the challenge is that if you do things like many people are to their tokens, like burns and like revenue shares and like things they can do in order to try and stimulate more people to buy to push the price up, uh, they move closer and closer to being a security token. Now, if you are a security token, that token cannot be traded or used for its utility on a cryptocurrency exchange, which would lead to delistings as all of the cryptocurrency exchanges are undergoing lots and lots of challenges from regulators at the moment as the industry tries to figure out what it is doing and where the industry is moving. At some point over the coming years, there's gonna be liquidity for the security token market, in which case you can do lots of interesting things at that stage um, with security tokens. At the moment, we want Bank to the Future token to be fully a utility token to get you priority access to deals. Um, the utility that other people do through integrations in coin payments um, and using those tokens anywhere coin payments is supported. Um, and also using them in order to get 50% discounted trading fees, which remember our secondary market is still in beta, still low liquidity. Um, and we've been working on several deals before we start getting more aggressive in marketing because we always want to tighten up our compliance. Bank to the future is never the fastest to move, but it's been here the first securities business in the crypto markets and is still here the longest. We intend to keep that um, and the reason we do that is because we're cautious. We don't make quick, fast decisions uh, based upon the whims, um, but we're always there in the long term. And we always try and make sure that we get these things right uh, before we roll them out more aggressively. So it's a patient game and Bank to the Future has very patient investors. We've attracted 85,000 of them. Um, and you know the, the, they're not the type of people that are pumping and dumping into IEOs and um, looking for the next shiny object. Um, they're here because they believe the future of finance looks very different from the past. They believe that this is a disruption of a multi-trillion dollar market. 
um, and they are looking for long-term high-risk, high-return opportunities, whereas, um, and that's the type of patient um, investor and uh, person that is engaged in our community. If you want other types of things, and there's plenty of other quick, fast pumps and dumps, and I'll tell you more about it um, from my experience in China and Korea and what we're seeing now as well. Um, but the, the idea here is that um, the, the Bank to the Future token has utility. We look to scale um, as we move out of beta on the secondary market. Um, and there's lots of interesting things we can do as this whole utility security token market unfolds. The last thing we want to do is do something drastic um, that uh, ruins the utility status of it. And then you end up with exchanges not being able to, to list it. And therefore you can no longer pay for your bank to the future, get your 50% discounted trading fees and all the other interesting use cases that we'll be rolling out. And remember, we've also got uh, the bank to the future exchange, security token exchange, um, that we're looking to build lots more utility for as that rolls out. So um, we really appreciate the, the, the suggestions. Um, increasing it to 100,000, um, I would prefer to work on increasing the utility of the token um, to make things more fair, but it's the game. The game of having a tradable token means that some people purchase it at lower prices, some people purchase it at higher prices, uh, and that's just the, the fun game and the nature of it really uh, being involved in, in, in the cryptocurrency market. So no plans for now. What I think would be, um, what I think would be easier to implement is additional benefits um, that we can come up with and we'll take your suggestions on what uh, they can get if you stake 100,000 tokens rather than 10,000 tokens. Um, but we've got lots of interesting plans and ideas for that. But you know, we, we have to wait for this whole utility security token thing to unfold. And it's going to become very clear and it's becoming more clear uh, as things progress. Also note, one other thing is that we're working on the technology that allows cryptocurrency exchanges to be able to offer security tokens through the bank to the future identity. Um, so we're going to have solutions for cryptocurrency exchanges and our shareholders in many of them um, over the years, uh, we're really excited about rolling that out as well. Um, and that's something we're really excited about doing next year. Actually, that followed on nicely onto the next question that that popped up on the live chat, which was um, the sign and thinking of launching a crypto exchange, because uh, it seems to have been most profitable on the um, on investments on BF platform. Yeah. So um, again, this is all subject to change, but I'll share my thinking um, as uh, with with all our community members that, that watch Bank to the Future live. Um, there's a couple of directions that we can go. Firstly, we acquired the altcoin.io technology. Um, we want to turn that into a security token exchange. I don't think the market needs another cryptocurrency exchange right now. Um, there is a buoyant ecosystem. Uh, there's, there's more than enough exchanges to serve uh, the current demand within the cryptocurrency industry. Um, but where I think we can have the biggest impact is in the security token market. And so that's something we're very excited about doing. Um, in, and so that's what we're really focusing on. And I think that there are two um, interesting plays in the security token market. One is securities built upon Bitcoin, and two is the more, the more developed market right now, which is securities built upon Ethereum. So we're looking at both of those, those um, plays. We're also looking at how we can partner with all of our um, portfolio companies in order to uh, build an ecosystem that has increased liquidity um, and we're building technology that allows them to engage um, in the security token market. Um, I think the better play is us focusing on the security token side and creating technology that allows our existing portfolio companies and cryptocurrency exchanges uh, to be able to um, expand their services into the security token market. I think that's the biggest impact Building a cryptocurrency exchange is really, really hard. Um, but we've got you know, our portfolio companies like the Bitstamps, like the Bitfinexes, like the Krakens, like the Coinbases, 
um, like the shapeshifts, like many others um, of our portfolio companies, they spend years building processes uh, to be great cryptocurrency exchanges. We spend years building processes to engage um, in security law compliance and setting securities. Um, I think there's some really interesting partnerships that we can work on throughout 2020 and beyond uh, that can take the banks of the future ecosystem to heights we've never experienced before. That's what we're really excited about. That's what we're working on. Um, and that's what we'll be uh, revealing to you each and every week on Bank to the Future Live as everything unfolds. Um, and I think we're very positioned within the Bank to the Future ecosystem to take advantage of all those opportunities. And whatever we do, we will always be thinking about how we can increase utility for Bank to the Future token as this whole thing unfolds. Okay, did you want to take another question or did you want to carry on to yeah, portfolio news? We've got let's quite do a few. Let's do it. <clears throat> okay, so one just actually just came through now. Uh, will US investors be able to use the BF Security Token Exchange? Um, not initially, uh, because that would require some additional ATS licenses. Um, that is not something we have right now, but we are speaking to our friends um, at BMI Capital. Um, and one of the first things we will be um, exploring with them is the opportunities to secure that ATS. Now, at the moment, the SEC has not been issuing many ATSs, uh, which is the license that would be required to do a security token exchange. Um, and so, you know, we don't necessarily want to be the first mover that um, is doing all the, the, the hard work there because we think we've got a great structure for launching non-US and uh, our, our partnership with BMI Capital will be exploring all those opportunities uh, as the ATS environment unfolds. Um, and so the answer is long-term yes, short-term no. All right. Uh, the next question here I have is, is it true you are launching Bitcoin Capital 4? Um, we are not launching Bitcoin Capital 4. Uh, I saw that Max Kaiser did a recent interview and uh, mentioned Bitcoin Capital 4. Um, he did contact me about whether we do it. No commitment yet. But it seems like uh, Max has actually been speaking with the guys at Morgan Creek. Um, which is uh, anti um, uh fund. And he is very keen to do Bitcoin Capital 4, um, but there's no commitment from us. Um, it's not something that we want to do at this stage. Um, but, uh, in, you know, if, if Max Kaiser wants to do that, we'll see how we can support him um, in doing that and whether he can put together a deal with uh, the, I, I can only say this because he publicly announced it, uh, we don't tend to publicly announce things um, unless they've already been publicly announced. Uh, so we wish them all the best in that. Um, and uh, if we can support in some way, we'll explore opportunities, but we're, we're not looking to do Bitcoin Capital 4. That was not in our roadmap. It wasn't a plan. And it's not something I'm looking to do at the moment. I've got a lot on my plate right now. Um, and uh, that's not something um, I'd like to be working on at this stage. All right. Um, so the next question I have here, I'm just picking them out. Um, what's the difference between staking coins on the platform versus just holding the BFT token in the cold in a cold wallet in terms of success or not in ICOs launching off the platform? Um, so we don't do ICOs, so the, 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 the token is not connected with ICOs. Um, if you put your 10,000 Bank to the Future tokens on the banktothefuture.com platform, which you can do in one of, one of two ways, you can either do it through our centralized custodial service, just go to log into your account. If, you're, if you've done your, if you completed your certification and verification, uh, head over to the fund section and there'll be a QR code and address. You can send as many BFT as you want to the platform. Uh, those will be held in a, in a more uh, centralized custodial way. Uh, there is also a decentralized, more self-custodial way, which is you can connect your uh, BF wallet, the Bank to the Future wallet, available on iOS and Android, and you can hold them there, connect it to your banktothefuture.com, and you keep the keys on your phone. 
Um, at the moment, if you hold 10,000 banks of the future tokens, then you get priority access, 48 hours head start on all deals and exclusive deals just for our premium members. Um, you also get, if you put them on the platform, you can spend them for put, uh, paying your trading fees, buy and sell orders on the Bank to the Future secondary market. Um, and you get a 50% discount for paying with Bank to the Future tokens. We lock those up. We don't do anything with them. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that's another uh, use for them. Um, we're also launching more reward services um, in the future. So the answer is, if you hold them on your own wallet, then you don't unlock any of the premium membership perks. If you hold them on the BF wallet and you connect it to your bank to the future.com account, then you get the premium membership as long as you maintain above 10,000. Um, and then if you hold them in custody on the bank to the future.com platform, then you can use them for spending on the secondary market, getting premium, premium access um, to deals. Um, and that's what most, most people trade uh, that are buying and selling on the secondary market are doing. All right, the next question I have here is the broker dealer investment. Was this a full buyout with your partners? Will this eventually enable Bank to the Future to have compliant security token exchange in the US? Um, the answer is no, it's not a full buyout because that would require permission from the SEC and FINRA. Um, that is a process we are happy to explore in the future, um, but we didn't want to do that because um, we want to very much, we want to keep uh, separation between the US part of the business executed by BMI Capital um, and the non-US part of the business. Because the last thing we want to do is bring our non-US investors into the jurisdiction of the US. We've always had that role of ensuring that um, people are only complying with their local regulations and not other jurisdictions when they don't need to. Um, so it's very important for us to keep that separation um, rather than drawing everybody into countries that they don't necessarily want to be a part of. That's been feedback and that's a, a unique process that we have, whereas other platforms, what they tend to do is they tend to, for example, have a US compliant platform and then everyone is treated as a US investor, which is different requirements. So we don't want to do that. We don't want to inflict um, things upon you uh, that don't necessarily need to happen. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why we do that. In terms of a US compliant security token exchange, um, we believe that the opportunity is in a non-US security token exchange um, for various reasons that we've uh, been discussing on our board and uh, through our roadmap. But at the same time, the US, once they get very clear about how they want to uh, proceed in this market, then um, BMI Capital, if they want to apply for an ATS, then we can structure a partnership and get that process signed off um, in order to allow US investors to engage in the security token space as that unfolds. And that's gonna be a long, longer term development because it requires you know, many things. Like you know, when, when we pioneered, when we got the, the first regulator in the world, the FSA at the time, to change the rules in order to allow for investing online in private equity and venture capital um, that later led to the Jobs Act where the US regulators adjusted their laws in light of what happened in the UK based upon um, those early conversations that we were having back in 2009-10. Um, you know, it still took the US about four years to make those adjustments and actually launch all parts of the Jobs Act um, and now security tokens are starting to engage in some of those regulatory changes. So these things don't happen fast, um, but uh, this is about building an ecosystem. And while the US decides how they're gonna do that with these ATSs, um, in the meantime, we can do interesting stuff outside of the US um, and make sure that our, our partners are engaging um, so that whenever it's ready uh, for full US compliance, uh, we can make sure that we have a, a great process for achieving that in compliance with the various different jurisdictions. That's always been our goal. Nice. I think I'm going to make this one the, the last question from the live chat, and then you can go into portfolio news. Um, will this uh, broker-dealer partnership accept corporate clients? I think you might have answered that one already. 
Uh, I did not answer that. That's a good oh. question. Um, so we have on our platform two types of accounts, organizational accounts, which is where you can sign up as a company um, or a trust or any type of institution. Um, there's a much harder onboarding process. It's uh, much harder uh, to get a company verified in compliance with um, you know, anti-money laundering laws than it is for an individual, unfortunately. Um, so there's, there's more documents you need to upload. We need to understand the ultimate beneficiary owners. Um, you need to have a, a company that's structured in a way where it's compliant to be able to invest. Um, and we need to know the, the people behind it, the directors behind it and the shareholders behind it. Um, so it's a, it's a bit more of a, a cumbersome process. Um, but once your company is verified, then you can do that. Um, and uh, that organizational process has also been built uh, for the equivalent of US accredited investor organizations um, so that BMI Capital can take advantage of organizational accounts as well for the institutions, um, as well as individual accounts as usual. So yes, is the, is the simple answer, um, but uh, we try to make it as simple as possible, um, but verifying a company um, and ensuring that that company qualifies to be able to invest under um, SEC guidelines through our broker dealer, uh, we have been working very aggressively through Bank to the Future Identity uh, to build that process uh, to make it as easy as we can. But you're going to have to get the documents out uh, to go through that, and it takes slightly longer to verify. There's no automated process for that. Okay, cool. So um, I think you can go through portfolio needs now. Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to head over to the screen share. Okay, and I'm going to stop sharing my camera for now. <clears throat> so uh, just uh, as usual, as I said earlier, I'm just showing you some of the deals on the platform right now. Edge just closed today. So congratulations to Edge. They got 89% of the total amount they want to raise. Um, and there were other deals that I guess get pushed to the bottom um, as soon as we move into closing. <clears throat> um, but Voltoro is live right now. And if in order to see those deals, head over to the Invest tab. And um, we've got four more in the pipeline uh, until we start closing off for the Christmas uh, quiet period. We'll still be open, of course, but uh, it, it tends to be a strange period for campaigns. As we said here, 700,000, and um, they're now on 959, heading over to that $1 million mark. Not sure when they're gonna close, if they're gonna close, um, but they can close early as soon as they have decided that that's as much as they want to raise. I remember the secondary market and the liquidity uh, discounts that we're seeing um, through the SPV at the moment, due to the fact that we're in beta um, and there's lots of undervalued opportunities for the largest companies in crypto based upon their last funding round market valuations um, are here where you can select those. So let's move over to some of the portfolio news. Um, firstly, congratulations to CoinFirm. CoinFirm was one of the deals that went live on our platform this year. Um, we were sharing that they were right time, right place, building lots of processes in order to help exchanges comply with their ongoing obligations um, as a result of the Financial Action Task Force um, requiring crypto exchanges to operate more in line with the processes that banks have to do. Well, Coin, uh, Coin Firm has now been signed up by Binance, the largest cryptocurrency exchange in the world, um, and they have integrated uh, their AML platform um, to help Binance comply as the regulators get more aggressive on exchanges. So really great to see that. Congratulations to all investors in CoinFirm. That's a top deal um, that CoinFirm has executed. They're also launching news services, which was another thing for CoinFirm in the news um, to allow uh, those that have um, had their cryptocurrency stolen um, to be able to track them and try and retrieve them. Um, so they've been doing some uh, interesting services. You know, we often in the crypto industry, um, obviously, uh, are not big fans of uh, any surveillance on the blockchain. But there's also another side to that, which is those that get things stolen. Um, law enforcement have more tools in order to help you recover um, stolen Bitcoins and use uh, laws, but also technology to try and find 
uh, where those have actually gone. So Coin Firm has been releasing more services there um, as one of our Bank to the Future portfolio companies. Um, we also congratulations to three of our portfolio companies. Uh, Ripple Labs and Coinbase have both invested in Bitso, which is the largest uh, cryptocurrency exchange in Mexico. Um, we're really excited to see in that. Um, they've been looking at using some of Ripple Labs technology in order to um, open a corridor between Mexico and the United States for remittance payments um, using Ripple Labs technology. So I assume that was a strategic investment uh, from Ripple. And also Coinbase Ventures, who have been doing more and more um, in their venture arm, um, have also invested in um, Bitso. So congratulations to Bitso. Um, they were a portfolio company of ours, I think back in 2015, if I remember correctly. Um, and there's been some big increases in the price of those shares as a result. And we have updated the Bitso pitch with the new prices. So congratulations to all those Bitso investors that are now helping build the ecosystem um, for cryptocurrencies at the same time as starting to see some of those pricing events and increases. Uh, what else do we have? So that's the Bitso news. Um, we also saw something from, let's have a look. Oh, Storage, uh, this was a, a very early deal, one of the very early first token sales. Um, they did a transition where they, because they were so early in the market, when they launched their token, which I think was back in 2015, 2014 maybe, um, it, the, the game was building tokens on Bitcoin using Omni um, and they built their first token on Omni and then as Ethereum started to gain more and more of the, the token market, uh, they did a transition where they did a one-to-one -one swap where people could swap their storage Omni tokens for storage Ethereum tokens. Um, well, they are discontinuing the Omni tokens right now. So if you happen to have some of those old tokens, if you're an OG um, token investor in the Bitcoin space, uh, then make sure that you do that swap uh, because storage, um, the, the, the service, the decentralized cloud storage provider that is looking to compete with AWS and other such services, uh, they'll be discontinuing those old tokens. Uh, so make sure you swap those in um, and contact storage if you want to do that. Um, the final, or there's a couple of, yes, the final bits of news was obviously there was a big announcement from two of our portfolio companies. One is uh, Bitcash, which operates and owns the K.IM platform um, with Kim.com as the chief evangelist and founder, um, and Bitfinex. So we brokered a deal between Bitfinex and K.IM. Um, in order to launch the, a token sale on the Bitfinex token sale platform. Um, but during that time frame, lots of things changed in the regulatory environment. There was the SEC um, EOS settlement. There was the Telegram case where they launched um, an emergency um, you know, action on Telegram, um, which is being uh, defended right now. Um, there was also things with uh, the Veritasia and Reggie Middleton uh, case and the environment for doing token sales upon uh, token sale platforms uh, started to become, you know, ultra risky. So they decided uh, mutually to, to indefinitely uh, postpone that token sale. Um, the word that I have heard is that it doesn't mean that they're canceling the token. They're just not doing the token sale for now. Um, and they're just adjusting their options based upon exploring um, equity and security tokens. So um, the, you know, those, those things are gonna need to be explored. As I said, very fast changing environment at the moment. Um, and also this kind of relates to some of the things I was seeing um, on my both the Korean uh, tour that I did and the China tour. Um, we were seeing, <clears throat> you know, uh, I don't know how best to put this. Um, the, the way that the Bitfinex team structured the token sale um, was all based upon supporting adoption, trying to avoid um, you know, some of the pump and dump effects that you see through initial exchange offerings. Um, and Bitfinex token sales were trying to do everything in the right way 
which is why they took the, 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 the decision to delay this uh, for, for long-term reasons. <clears throat> um, but some of the practices that we're seeing based upon um, some of the exchanges that have found us based in China um, and some of the things that we're seeing, uh, really the, the IEO market, I think, is uh, really engaging in, in very uh, discouraging, um, nasty practices in order to try and pump tokens on day one, use market making as a way of early investors exiting to um, retail purchases. And just, it's, it's, it's a really nasty market. I got to meet many of the investors that are looking for such opportunities and the short-termism and the ethics of what, the, what some of these investors think are acceptable um, for a quick buck is just not something that I think helps the cryptocurrency market in any way, shape or form. Um, it's why we introduce, you know, try to introduce a deal to the Bitfinex token sale platform. They're looking to do things in the right way. Um, and some of these, uh, you know, these IEO platforms and the shady practices, I just see no sustainability in that market. Um, and we really look forward to ushering in um, the next wave of crypto, you know, uh, capital markets disruption done in the correct way. Um, and, uh, you know, with removing some of these, uh, disrupting some of these shady practices. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the stuff that we saw um, just wasn't for me, uh, just didn't quite sit right. And, um, you know, some of these practices around IEOs, I, I just don't think are sustainable or the right way to go about it. And so, you know, even though the Bitfinex uh, team we're doing things in the right way without some of these uh, shady practices. Um, it, it, the regulatory environment changed and the K.IM platform decided that they're going to have to take a step back and just and, and figure out the right, more sustainable way of doing this. So we really look forward to, again, kind of require some more patience, but we look forward to seeing what comes next um, from some more of our portfolio companies. Uh, there. So that's the final story I've got. I'm sure that led to some additional questions. So let me just check everything. Uh, that story is done. Um, and remember also, if you want the latest announcements, it's not very clear right now, but I believe we're about to launch a new homepage that will actually have um, more clear direction in terms of our announcements because it's hidden there in the footer but uh, you can always catch our announcements, previous episodes of Bank to the Future live, new deals going live, and all of the different latest things uh, upon our blog. It's not really a blog, it's more of a news and announcement section. So I think we should update that accordingly to reflect what it is uh, more accurately. Um, but I'm gonna now head over to doing um, a face. Let me see how I stop sharing my screen. And hopefully you can see me and we've got approximately, well, just under seven minutes, uh, maybe a bit more for any questions that came up as a result of the portfolio news. So uh, for me, if you've got anything for me, we'll try and answer a, a few more questions. Yeah, sure. Actually, just got a really nice uh, comment that came through. Good work, Simon and Bank to the Future team have seen many updates and good news in the last three to four months. Yeah, um, well, I think the you know we're we, we're trying to get uh, better at that. We have invested additional resources into our communications. Uh, we still got a long way to go, so we we really appreciate your feedback. But also encouragement along the way really helps our team to do their best work. Um, you know, the, there's a lot of negativity in the crypto market um, for good reasons, but uh, at the same time, some encouragement um, and letting our team know when they're doing good work always encourages people to work harder and, and perform better work and, and listen to that feedback. So thank you. All right, so uh, we do have some questions that came through during the week um, from forum and from, from Telegram. So, I mean, we have a few minutes, so I don't know if you can try and keep the answers short and sweet. <laughs> Or we could just go through as many as we can and then we can roll it out to next week. Sorry, what was that, Simon? When have I ever kept it short and sweet? 
No, I know. That's why I was laughing. <laughs> All right. So um, one question slash comment. Why hasn't Bank to the Future prioritized availability of its own stock on the trading platform? It's been way too long. Also, why has there been literally no marketing of um, BFT to date? The liquidity on the platform is dismal. Without marketing, uh, without marketing the platform, how do you expect to address this very fundamental issue? Okay, so hopefully I answered some of those questions. Um, and uh, thank you for the more direct approach. We'll try and take some of those uh, those questions. So what the, the first section, sorry, I forgot the, the second and the third. What was the first part? Yeah, it was, uh, why has a Bank to the Future prioritized availability okay. of its own stock yeah. and training platform? So um, the answer to that is we're working on something. So look, we've, we've done several acquisitions, several strategic investments. Uh, this year and with each one it, we've had a roadmap of a pricing model of increasing the valuation each time we have a deal so um, if you are a bank to the future um, investor via our parent company bf global um, we've got a roadmap that we think maximizes the valuation and we've also got a two to three year plan that we think um, will you know if we can execute uh, reward um, our long-term investors um, and get a, a very nice um, return as our goal for our shareholders. Um, and part of that was a gradual increasing price as a result of real deals and real growth. Um, putting the bank to the future um, uh, company uh, through one of our SPV structures on the secondary market was something that we wanted to do immediately but then we started engaging in deals and didn't want to um, allow the price on the secondary market to be used against us in some of the negotiations as a result of some of those that um, probably want liquidity because they were very early investors and you received ultra, ultra high returns. And so um, those people might push the price um, to an unfavorable SPV price relative to the deals that we want to complete. That's one of the reasons. Second is something I can't tell you yet, um, but we have started to engage in a structuring deal um, that I think will be really, really beneficial for all of those that own shares in Bank to the Future. Um, and that's gonna lead to the product launch that we're looking at launching if all goes to plan and everything gets signed off at the North American Bitcoin conference in mid January. Um, and it relates to uh, the, the, you know, bank to the future itself. So um, it's not lining up listing it on the secondary market, given the plans that we currently have, but no doubt we will make sure that that's available to you at some stage, but I guess you're going to have to put a bit of trust in us in ensuring that we're implementing a strategy that maximizes the value for all of our shareholders. Um, and uh, we will keep posting updates in the investor zone. And sorry to be slightly vague, but um, there, there are certain things where we have non-disclosure agreements in all these deals and we can't necessarily announce them, but we've got plenty lined up for increasing shareholder value. And it's in my interest as the largest shareholder um, in Bank to the Future as well. Oh, uh, so the, first part, the second part was marketing. Um, we have increased the marketing resources, the marketing personnel. Um, the reason that we still are here today um, is because we have been less aggressive on marketing than some of our competitors, which are all experiencing regulatory issues as a result of their more aggressive marketing. Having said that, um, we've now got a structure that we believe can allow us to expand um, some of the marketing in key jurisdictions um, and still remain, you know, um, uh, not too aggressive in, um, you know, uh, in some of the aggressive practices that others do. Um, we have increased our personnel in that side. We have a roadmap. There are several things that we need to do that you will never even know that we're doing because it just doesn't affect you in terms of being able to communicate with our investors based upon what they've invested in, how they've invested, 
and also implement some you know processes that allow us to take advantage of some of our marketing and um, that has been put on the back burner for a while but it's um, as we move over to a quiet period of Christmas I think we can start to look at some of those things that keep that have been put back um, and yes we do have a two-year one to two year marketing plan that we will be implementing uh, now that we've secured some of the regulatory clarity that allows us to be more comfortable in being a bit more aggressive in marketing. Um, liquidity is uh, abysmal on the secondary market. I agree to you. There's two ways of looking at that. That either gives you um, a, an opportunity to purchase undervalued securities relative to the underlying company valuation. So that is both an opportunity um, and a problem if you're looking to liquidate right now. Um, but uh, liquidity is low by design um, because we want to come out of beta first. We launched it in beta so that we could kick the tires. Um, we had to implement automated withdrawals, automated deposits, new banking partnerships, new escrow arrangements, new compliance, new transaction monitoring processes. Um, we had to get all of that right. Um, then we want to launch more deals on the market. Um, and then, and only then, once we've completed some of the acquisitions that allowed us to do things in a more compliant structure, then do we want to start engaging in marketing. So I agree with you on many of those points, um, but yeah, unfortunately patience is required in order to get maximum valuations um, and uh, disrupt traditional finance in a, in a way where we're protected we try to get the right balance between innovation um, and compliance. That's our goal. All right. So it looks like we've hit the four o'clock mark now. But um, can I just ask you one last question, which has actually popped up everywhere? Mm -hmm. It's about the portfolio value. Mm. Um, the portfolio section of our platform absolutely stinks and sucks right now. In fact, it's got worse. Um, it was a lot better. Uh, you used to be able to track the initial price, the, uh, the, the, the lots of different things, and it was just really a lot easier to see um, the value of your portfolio and track it. When we launched a, the secondary market into beta, we had to completely overhaul everything we had done in terms of uh, how we were actually um, in order to make these, uh, you know, these securities uh, transferable amongst our qualifying investors. We had a choice. We either get everything perfect um, and then launch it, or we launch the secondary market into beta and launch a disgusting version of the portfolio. Uh, we are fully aware that the portfolio section doesn't give you the information you need. It's not pretty. It's not nice. Um, we had it in our roadmap and uh, we were ready to release it. Then we had all these um, urgent things that popped up, changing our escrow structure, car payments, um, changing banking partnerships, additional compliance requirements, some of the deals we had to do, integration into new US compliance, new EU compliance. Um, and fortunately, portfolio just uh, got um, uh, put, put off and off and off. Um, there are a couple of things that we still need to do, um, but portfolio is such an important part of our platform. And we, we ask you for your patience. We know what we need to do. We know what you want. Uh, we know how to make it look better. We know how to make it work. Um, there is just only so many things that we can do. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, we have to stick to the roadmap and sometimes change it. So, uh, portfolio is something you will see a lot better next year, uh, but, um, you know, yeah, bear with us is, is all I can say on that. So I think that's um, the, the last question uh, that we've got time for. Uh, I think it was really good to have more of an interactive session, answer more of your questions. The better your questions are, the better we can um, deliver our service, adjust our roadmap, and um, you know, work together on, on, on achieving some of what I believe is the most exciting time in financial history. So for me, to thank you for pulling out all those questions. Uh, please do subscribe to our channel if you don't wanna miss any more of these. Uh, we have more videos to come. We'll be going live each and every week as usual. Uh, we do interviews, we do lots of things with our portfolio companies. Let us know what you'd like to see 
in the comment section, hit the subscribe button. And if you hit the bell symbol, YouTube will notify you each and every time that we go live. Uh, let us know in Telegram, let us know on Twitter. Maybe you're watching on Facebook. Um, but that is going to do it for episode 38 of Bank to the Future Live with great news for our US investors that we look forward to rolling out. Thank you for your time.